welcome. And there's no better way to start this season than with Russ Cohen as our first speaker. My name's Beth Wilkinson, and I'm the moderator of this virtual event. As most of you probably know, Newton Conservators is an all volunteer nonprofit started in 1961 that works to preserve and to maintain open space in Newton. For more information about our organiza organization, check out our website at newtonconservators.org. We'd really love to have you become a member and all new members get a trail guide as a welcome gift. Newton Conservators acknowledges that Newton and the open spaces that we promote and steward are located on the traditional, contemporary, and unceded territories of the Massachusetts. We acknowledge that Massachusetts stewardship of this land kept its ecological communities vibrant, strong, and interconnected for thousands of years. Newton Conservators hopes to build authentic relationships with the Massachusetts, and we recognize that there is much work to be done here. Our simple land acknowledgement is only an imperfect first step in that process. Tonight's webinar, Nibbling on Native Plants in Your Garden by Russ Cohen, will focus on species of native edible wild plants suitable for adding to your own landscape. Russ is the author of one of my favorite guides, Wild Plants I Have Known and Eaten. Since his retirement as the Rivers Advocate for the Mass Department of Fish and Games Division of Ecological Restoration, Russ has had more time to pursue his avocation, which is connecting to nature via his taste buds and assisting us in doing the same thing. Recently, he set up a small nursery in Weston where he grows over a thousand plants that he propagates from seed. So let's hear more about our delicious options directly from him. Welcome, Russ. Hi, everyone. Basically, you just need to listen to me. I'll just pull up my screen and we'll go for there. So you get to look at pictures and not me. And OK, so here's my land acknowledgement, which is, a, a you know, reinforcing what uh, Beth just said. And let me just uh, go one step beyond uh, what she said, though, and talk about the relevance of the substance of what I'm talking about today, because here's where I have to really express some gratitude because, of course, it was the indigenous peoples, the Massachusetts and other tribes of the area we now call New England and the Northeast that figured out what was edible for the thousands of years they were interacting with these plants way before white people like me showed up. So boy, am I grateful that they uh, did all that and that that knowledge trickled down to me. And so um, so thank you uh, for that. And, and if there were a book that I would single out and say, uh, this is one I strongly recommend that you read. It's this one by Robin Wall Kimmerer, Braiding Sweetgrass, which uh, has got to be among my top uh, all-time favorite books. Uh, and, uh, and one thing in particular I'd like to point out to you, and it's a section in this book that Robin calls the honorable harvest. And so, um, so if, all you do is just read this chapter in Braiding Sweetgrass. I think it will really help you to uh, connect to the outdoors through your taste buds, but in a very respectful and reciprocal way, which is a part of the message here. You know, uh, interacting with the woods is not just taking the gifts that Mother Nature provides, the berries and the nuts and stuff like that. It's what can you do to give back? And my way of giving back is propagating these edible native plants and then adding them in appropriate places in the landscape. So uh, we'll get into the details of how I do that uh, in a second. Okay, but I have to talk about somebody else who's had a very important effect on planting native plants. And that's this guy right here. So were this to be a live program, I'd be asking you, uh, who in the audience has, who knows, who doesn't know this guy? I'm, I'm going to assume by now that most of you have heard of Doug Talmy. So Doug is an entomologist from the University of Delaware. And a number of years ago, he made a very astute observation that our wonderful migrating songbirds, as they fly from their wintering grounds and they build their nests, they lay the eggs and the eggs hatch, hatch and the little baby birds are, are yelling for food. What are the parent birds feeding them? They're feeding them insects, mostly caterpillars, and they're finding those caterpillars on the native plants. And the caterpillars aren't on the non-native plants. Well, why is that? The basic reason is that since plants can't move, their major defense is chemical. And our native insects have figured out ways to get around the chemical defenses, not so much to eat the plants into extinction because that would be very counterproductive, 
but they're able to live off the plants and the plants continue to thrive. And it's a dynamic equilibrium and, and everybody gets along in, in a, a, an ecological balance. And in the meantime, that's where the birds find the insects to feed their babies in the nest. So in a landscape of all non-native plants, it's like a food desert to a bird uh, that needs uh, to find insects to feed its young. So that's why it's really important to plant um, native plants, according to Doug Talamy. And that just that reason is enough to get uh, groups and individuals to plant uh, native in their yards, which is terrific. So, uh, so here's one of Doug's more recent books, Nature's Best Hope. And basically, when you read the book, you'll see that nature's best hope is all of us. If we all, uh, you know, put native plants in our yards and basically uh, uh, reestablish the ecological food web instead of the food deserts that, that just a sterile uh, lawn represents. So lots of people are doing this, which is great. And, uh, and different organizations and states are getting into the act by putting out outreach materials, printed ones, websites, all intended to educate people about native plants, where to find them, what they are, what wildlife depend on them, and stuff like that. All really good. Okay, now I'm going to tell you a story about a talk I went to at the Ecological Landscape Alliance Conference about five years ago that was given by this wonderful woman, Kate Venturini, who works in Rhode Island. And at the time, her major focus is on landowners that live right along the shore of Narragansett Bay. And she was trying to get them to put native plants in their yards to help as a vegetative buffer to help absorb the pollutants, the fertilizers, and the runoff from the roads and stuff like that, and absorb all that stuff before it got into the bay and keep the bay, bay clean really important objective. So in her talk, she had this slide. And uh, those of you that dealt a lot with plants, this is a very familiar format where you see the name of the plant on the left side and then all these attributes and columns to the right. Grows tall, grows short, like sun, like shade, and so on. So I went up to Kate at the end of her talk and I said, Kate, where's your edibility column? And she said, oh, we don't tell people that. And I said, why not? She said, we don't want people to eat these plants. We want them to leave them for the wildlife. I thought, oh, that's interesting. You have blueberry on your list. Are you suggesting that people plant blueberries and then never go out and pick a blueberry themselves? Oh, we wouldn't do that. Okay, then you might as well tell people what else is edible. So now they do. In Rhode Island, their native species information has an edibility column. And this is the point of this talk. The fact that many of our native species are edible by people too provides an additional powerful incentive for people to plant them that might be insufficiently induced to do so just in the pure ecological rationale. So pardon me while I dwell on stereotypes for a moment. So in my mind, I imagine suburban couple, maybe they live in Newton, husband and wife with a good sized yard, and the wife has heard Doug Tallamy's talk. She's read Doug Tallamy's book. And she said, oh, we have to plant native. This is really important. We have to do it. And the husband says, I like the yard the way it is. I don't want to change anything. And that's when she can coax him to go into one of my talks. Maybe he's in the audience tonight and could see all about all these edible native species. And, you know, it's the what's in it for me angle that I think, uh, you know, I don't think it's going to get everybody to rip out their lawn and put in native plants. But my feeling is that we'll win an additional group of people that aren't sold on the pure ecological, what I pejoratively refer to as the bug and bunny argument. Do it because it's good for the bugs and the bunnies. So uh, yeah, so that's what the theme of this talk is about. I'm going to give you an example after example after example of edible native species that you might consider for your own yard. So before we get into that, let's talk about, okay, how do you know a plant is native? Well, a really good website that I heartily recommend if you haven't been there is the Go Botany website that's maintained by the Native Plant Trust. And it has a, a sheet like this for every species that grows in New England. So not just the native ones, the non-natives, invasives, all that stuff too. And the way you can tell very quickly whether it's native or not is the color right here in the, in, in the map. And these black outlines are county outlines. And so Middlesex County is right about here. And so you'll see for a spice bush, that's what Lindera benzoin is, that's colored green, which means spice bush is native to Middlesex County. If spice bush had not been native, this color would be pink. All right, so that's good. You know that spice bush is native. And then uh, in addition, some people like to pay attention to ecoregions because, of course, plants don't know how to read political maps. They, they don't pay attention to political boundaries. They grow where the ecosystem is suitable for them. And so, as you see from this map, ecoregions uh, don't really line up with political boundaries either. 
And so uh, some people pay close attention to ecotype and they really strongly believe that local ecotype plants should be planted. And I've heard some debate about this amongst botanists and, and ecologists, and I think reasonable minds could differ in the issue, but I will concede at least that if you are able to get a local ecotype plant or local ecotype seed, uh, then I, a good argument can be made that that plant has a greater chance of succeeding in the same ecotype where the plant is from because it's adapted to those particular conditions. All right, so let's go on. So where do you get wild seed to plant? Well, one good source is the Wild Seed Project. This is up in Maine run by a good friend, Heather McCargo. And some of the seeds she has are edible. So here's five edible species that she sells in her catalog. And, um, and sometimes I'll uh, get extra seed when I'm gathering seed for myself and I'll share it with Heather. All right, and uh, if you wanna know what would work in my yard, here's all this great information, but I wanna know what would work in my yard. If you haven't been there, the Native Plant Trust has got this great plant finder database where you can basically click the boxes here to represent any conditions that you want. Like you got a, you're near the coast, you need a salt tolerant plant, you get a really dry yard, need a drought tolerant, you get a deer problem, whatever you click the box. So I clicked the edible box and I got 80 results. There's actually more than 180 species that are native to Northeast eco regions that are edible by people, but 80 is a pretty good representative example. All right, so sweet fern is one of the plants that came up. So then I clicked on the sweet fern page and here's the information I got about sweet fern that says where it likes to grow and so on and its native range and all that. So that's the information that's available at the Native Plant Trust Plant Finder page. So I strongly encourage you to go that to get specific guidance of what you think will work in your yard. All right, so now with that, let's begin to talk about specific edible native species. And I'm gonna apologize ahead of time that I have these plants organized chronologically by foraging opportunity. <laughs> and that just goes to my roots as a forager that I did for you know 45 years before I became an edible native species propagator and planter. So that's just the way my brain thinks. Other people that talk in this subject organize things, which I think is more useful to people. They say, okay, here's all the plants that like sun. Here's all the plants that like shade. Here's all the plants that like, uh, uh, you know, they grow tall. Here's the plants that grow short. And I just don't do that. So uh, I just bear with me as I go chronologically. And I think you'll get enough information from my slides that you'll still be able to make sense of it. All right, so let's start with this one. Okay, so if this were live group, I would say in the audience, how many of you know what this is? And I'd expect you all to chime in and say fiddleheads, and that would be correct. But knowing it is a fiddlehead is not enough to know that it's an edible plant because almost all ferns go through this quote unquote fiddlehead stage where you see the, the frond, which is gonna open up and be big, all feathery and stuff when it's all cold up like the top of a violin in the spring. I only know of two species of fern of the many that grow around here that are edible and only one that's safe to eat in quantity. And that's this one. This is the ostrich fern. This is the quote unquote fiddlehead fern, the kind you see for sale in the stores and the fancy um, restaurants and stuff like that. And, uh, and I'll talk about them again in just a second. So uh, how do you know this is the ostrich fern? There's five different ways to tell. I'll talk about three right here. So you see how the, the fiddleheads are growing in a vase-shaped clump. That's what you wanna look for first. Also, there are these brown papery scales that flake off the uh, curled up part really easily. So it's not like a wool, like a cinnamon fern. And then in the center of the stalk, there's a gouge that if we cut the stalk in cross section, it would form a U-shape. So ostrich fern always has those things. Okay. Um, uh, let me just make sure I can go backwards here. Let's see what happens when I do this. Okay, so yeah. All right, so uh, good, I'm gonna be able to go backwards. Okay, so um, now uh, to talk about Native Americans again, one really cool thing about uh, Native Americans is something called traditional ecological knowledge that, um, that they hold and sometimes it's trickled down to me. So here's uh, something I learned from Nancy Turner, who's an ethnobotanist actually from British Columbia. But what I learned from her is the Malice tribe, which also it's in New Brunswick, but it, it's also in Maine too. The name they use to describe ostrich fern is the same exact term they use to describe the circling motion a dog makes before it lies down. And isn't that amazing? I would never have noticed that 
can, uncannily similar pattern until you know the the traditional ecological knowledge embedded in this tribal language made it clear to me. So um, so that's great. All right. So let's go to um, another thing to look for when you're trying to find ostrich ferns in the wild. This is the kind of habitat that they're most predominant in, and this is the alluvial floodplain soil. So I took this photo along the Connecticut River where there's many, many fiddleheads just growing in the wild. Um, but, uh, but yes, fiddleheads can grow in your yard, and I'll talk about that in just a second. Okay, then the last thing, the fifth thing to look for is what's called the fertile fronds, these spore-bearing fronds at the base of the plant. So earlier in the spring, when these furled up fronds, uh, furled out fronds, and you see how much the vase shape shows up now, if this was in the fiddlehead stage, those fertile fronds would still be there. And if you look at the stem of the fertile front, it also has that U shape if you cut it in cross section. So those are the five ways to distinguish the ostrich fern from any other species of fern. Okay, so let me just go back and back. Okay, so now I wanna talk about conservation because it's really important when you're harvesting native species to be to show some forbearance and restraint when you're harvesting them because native species, as I explained, often have important roles in the ecosystem. Animals, pollinators, and other animals rely upon uh, our native plants for food and some other important portion of their life cycles. So it's really important that you don't upset the ecological balance in any way. So when I'm gathering fiddleheads out from a wild patch, and and the advice I give to anybody else who does this is please limit your harvesting to one or two of the curled up parts per clump. That's a sustainable level of harvest. Unfortunately, some uh, greedy people go in and they'll pick every single fiddlehead they see. And that saps a lot of strength and rise them. You can actually kill the fern by harvesting it that hard. So one or two per clump is fine. All right, and, uh, and you do have to cook fiddleheads thoroughly before you eat them because an undercooked fiddlehead has got an enzyme in it called thiaminase, which can actually break down vitamin B1 in your body. So you don't wanna do that, cook them thoroughly. All right, speaking of cooking, so if you've ever bought fiddleheads at the store, brought them home, cooked them up and weren't very impressed with them, you might wanna try this cooking method, which was amply demonstrated to me by this naturalist, Beth Basler, who works out in Western Mass. And she took a bunch of us to a patch of fiddleheads along the Connecticut River, and she brought her camp stove with her to the fiddlehead patch. And we were eating those fiddleheads 10 minutes after we picked them. And they were truly exquisite that way. All right, and so here's a, a photo I took in Lexington where the ostrich ferns are de deployed in a landscape, you know? So this is an alluvial floodplain soil. This is just in somebody's backyard uh, next to a roadway here. And I don't know this for sure, but I would wager that this homeowner has no idea that this is actual the edible ostrich fern, fiddlehead fern. So here's another view of the same thing. And these ferns do reproduce vegetatively and they will spread once you plant them in. So you see they do really well in just a suburban yard, uh, uh, not particularly wet or alluvial at all. All right, so that's uh, example number one, ostrich fern is a possible edible plant for your yard. Okay, so here's marsh marigold, and this would be more limited to people that actually have flowing streams on their property, because that's where marsh marigold occurs naturally. And this is a gorgeous spring ephemeral wildflower. So I would never want to harvest this plant in any way that would harm it. And so when I'm gathering to eat it, I'm picking one or two leaves per plant. That's it, leaving all the leaves attached to the plant. And that's not a lot of food. Um, so, uh, you probably wouldn't want to harvest marsh marigold at all unless you're in a place where there are many hundreds of them. And I have seen places like that, not so much in Eastern Mass, but in Western Mass and out in New York State, we have wetlands where there are thousands of marsh marigolds. And certainly a place like that, pick one or two leaves per clump, and you'll have a lot of leaves. And this is a plant you absolutely have to boil these leaves to make them safe to eat because they're actually toxic in the raw state. So cook them thoroughly. You might even change the water once or twice before you eat them. And they taste like spinach. You might say, well, well, I can go buy spinach from the, from the store. And I would say, yeah, that might be a good idea actually, because as I say, this is a special wildflower, but I put it in my show because this is a plant 
with a long history of country people eating it. Because remember, back in the days, like before World War II, not everybody had refrigerators, not stores carried vegetables year round. So a lot of people depended on eating things they had put up over the winter, stuff from the root cellar, stuff like that. So when spring came, they were really eager to eat green and growing things as soon as they could. And some of these wild plants like marsh marigold and ostrich fern, they're available to harvest before anybody had anything going on in their gardens. So, so these were uh, well-known and appreciated by people uh, years ago. So, and yes, you can grow marsh marigold from seed. The seeds ripe in June. And so here's marsh marigold I grew uh, in my nursery just from sowing the seeds of plants I gathered. Uh, very fun. Okay, so here's another native species. And this is a plant that um, uh, grows mostly in less acidic habitats is where you're gonna find it naturally. So not so much in Eastern New England, but in Western New England, like the Berkshires, Vermont, stuff like that. And it's a plant that uh, has been around for thousands of years. Native Americans use it extensively. In fact, the city names Chicago and Winooski, Vermont are derived from Native American uh, words for this species. And it's a species that country people would know about and gather a few leaves when they were um, turkey hunting, trout fishing in the spring, and all of that was fine. Okay, though, but about 15 years ago, this plant began to experience a meteoric rise in popularity because the chefs and the foodies started hyperventilating about it. And they called it the Southern Appalachian name, which is Ramps, okay? The New England traditional name is Wild Leek, but that's, but it began to call Ramps. And so, uh, so what this did is this created, unfortunately, kind of a gold rush mentality where people were going to the woods not to connect with nature, not to gather themselves, but they'd find a patch like this, they dig up every single plant and sell it. So obviously this is not a sustainable way of harvesting this plant. So here's another patch of it. And right here, you see the uh, Dutchman's breeches, which is an indication that this plant typically likes the rich woods habitat, or a neutral pH, definitely not acidic. Uh, and it grows in association with some of our most cherished spring ephemeral wildflowers, like wild ginger and trilliums and bloodroot and, and, uh, and the Dutchman's breeches and uh, maidenhair fern, stuff like that. And so... Um, yeah, so I know places in the Berkshires where there used to be patches of the wild leeks like this, where they've been completely obliterated, extirpated. Every single plant was dug up. So that's not good. And uh, so I've been trying to get the word out to folks, if you're going to harvest this plant from the wild, don't dig up the plants. In fact, just enjoy the leaves. The leaves are delicious. So here's a close-up of the plant. You see that each plant has two, sometimes three or more leaves. And the leaves go down to a bulb, but you can leave the bulb on the ground. Just pick one leaf per plant. We'll leave the remaining leaf for leaves. Attach the bulb, leave the bulb on the ground. It's a totally uh, sustainable way of harvesting this plant. You can enjoy the wonderful oniony, garlicky flavor without harming the plant at all. Because this is what can happen, unfortunately. So this is a photo I took at a very famous restaurant, Blue Hill at Stone Barnes restaurant, Dan Barber's restaurant. I don't know if he's still doing this, but this is years ago when he's not even using the ramp bulbs in one of his fancy restaurants. He's just menus. He's just pickling them, which I think is a waste. I think these plants were dug up unnecessarily. unnecessarily. And then even the Berkshire Food Co-op at one point was selling the ramps with the bulbs attached. And so uh, I got on their case about that. So uh, you don't have to dig up these plants uh, from the wild. Ah, but here's additional good news is you can propagate plants. And here is a shot I took from the, actually, I got this photo from the Native Plant Trust, where they have stock beds, where they grow the ramps in very, very dense conditions. And they're able to pull out a certain percentage of plants like this uh, from the uh, stock bed occasionally. And these plants, they pot up and sell at the retail location. And then people can buy plants, ethically harvested plants from uh, garden the woods and then plant them in their own yards, which I've done in my yard. I recommend that you do in your yard so you have your own private ramp patch so you don't even have to have to pilfer any other ramps. You've got your own. But if you do that, I bet you don't dig up the plants because that would be like killing the goose that laid the golden egg. No, you just harvest the leaves and enjoy them and the bulbs would stay on the ground and next year they produce a fresh, fresh set of leaves for you. All right. Now, here's another native species that's uh, uh, more common in this area than the ramp, and this is the milkweed, and this obviously has a really important ecological role that I'll talk about in a second. But first, let's talk about the edible roles. So, um, 
So Beth mentioned the book I wrote, and I'll get to that at the end of my talk, Wild Plants I've Known and Eaten. There's an entire chapter devoted to milkweed with a great recipe in it that I'll mention in just a second. And the subtitle to the chapter in um, the um, in my book is Procrastinating Forager's Dream Food because there's at least five edible parts to milkweed and they happen chronologically in succession. So if you mess up and wait a while and miss a stage, you just wait a while till the next edible stage develops. So this is actually edible stage number three, the flower buds, when they're in a nice tight green cluster, they're edible. And by the way, I recommend the same cooking method for all parts of the milkweed uh, that you're going to eat. And that is to get a pot of water boiling in the stove, drop whatever milkweed part is you're wanting to eat and boil it for seven minutes. And that makes it totally safe to eat. And milkweed will not shrink or get mushy on you even after all that boiling. So here on the right, you see a bowl of milkweed buds. And these have been boiled for seven minutes already. And look how good they look. If anything, they look even nicer than they did on the plant. And so you could eat these just plain as a vegetable, as a side dish. Or one great way to use them is in this recipe from my book called Milkweed Egg Puff, which is like a cross between a souffle and a casserole that uses the milkweed buds. And even the uh, pods, the milkweed pods are edible when they're up to an inch long. Uh, you can boil them for seven minutes and the texture, the flavor is really similar to green beans. All right, though, but here is the monarch butterfly caterpillar to remind us that, yes, milkweed plants are really important to have in the landscape for the monarchs. And so I would not want to do anything that uh, reduces the likelihood of a monarch finding a plant to, to uh, lay their eggs on and have the caterpillars eat leaves and so on. If you're harvesting the young pods, they don't play any significant role in the butterfly's life cycle. So that would be one way to do it. But here's the additional way I do it, where I'm walking the walk in my own yard. And let me show you how I do that. All right, so here's my house, there's my car, there's my boat on top of the house, and here I planted some blueberries next to our driveway, and I also allowed the common milkweed to grow in my driveway, and the monarchs have found the plants, and the uh, females lay their eggs on the plants, and there's a chrysalis attached to our garage door from a uh, pupa that fortunately the butterfly attached it to the hinge in the garage. So when the door went up and down, it didn't squish the chrysalis and it was there for two weeks. And one day we went out and it was empty. The, the, the butterfly metamorphosed and split the, cat, the chrysalis open and flown away. Yeah. So you can do it in your own eye, uh, yard. You can create milkweed habitat in your own yard. Okay, so here's another native species. This is the basswood, the Tilia americana. Now, we also have very commonly in the landscape the Tilia cordata, which is the little leaf linden. It's a tree from Europe that I think the pollinators probably also like too. And it's edible the exact same way as our native species. So, whether it's a native one that I encourage you to plant or the non native one, uh, you can eat it either way. So, the young leaves are edible but uh, the flowers are also edible. Actually, they're drinkable as you make a tea from the flowers as a delightful lemon honey flavor. And it also, besides tasting good, has two medicinal values. It's soothing to your digestive system and to your mental state at the same time. So herbalists really love this plant uh, to recommend to people. And, um, and of course, we've all heard the message by now, it's important to plant for the pollinators. And I agree. Uh, but often the emphasis is on forbs and other herbaceous species, uh, you know, the, the monardas and stuff like that, which is, yes, very important. But there are trees that are valuable to pollinators too. And this one, definitely the uh, 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 basswood tree is one. In fact, uh, this hasn't happened to me, but I've heard that if you um, stand next to a basswood tree when it is blooming, you can hear the tree as well as see the flowers because there's so many bees and other pollinators working the flowers that the buzz, buzzing noise from all those berries wearing the, the bees wearing the flowers is edible. Uh, sorry, audible. <laughs> okay, sassafras. So this is a native species that uh, you might want to consider for your yard if you don't have it already. It's exceedingly easy to recognize in the wild because it leaves with three different shapes all in the same tree. And um, and it has two edible parts. So there's the bark on the root, which has the characteristic root beer flavor. Now, let me just say, in the interest of full disclosure, that saffron was an essential oil that's in the sassafras root bark. The Food and Drug Administration thinks that is a carcinogen. And so they have banned naturally containing saffron products from the food supply, mainly sassafras. Uh, but, um, but that's that uh, 
uh, administrative decision was based on studies where they fed the saffron to rats. And I've heard that humans metabolize saffron in a way that it doesn't make saffron carcinogenic to people. And furthermore, cinnamon and nutmeg also have saffron in them, and they haven't been banned by the government. So I will leave the decision up to you. I'll just say that the sassafras roots is very tasty, it makes a, a, a very tasty root beer or a tea. And in my book, I've got a recipe for sassafras candy, which is like the root beer barrels that you used to buy at the penny candy store, only even better because it's little bits of root bark and better than the candy. But if you want to eat another part of a sassafras where the saffron isn't an issue, you can gather the young leaves and make filet powder from them. So that's what filet powder is. It's dried powdered young sassafras leaves. And so in the spring, when the leaves are about an inch long, now obviously you wouldn't strip this plant bare of leaves. You pick a few leaves off this plant, go to another plant and pick a few leaves. And then you dry them, pulverize them into a powder. And then you add that powder to soups and stews at the end to flavor them uh, and thicken them. And another reason why you might want to plant sassafras in your yard it is a really underappreciated fall foliage plant. It has truly gorgeous fall colors uh, that are really nice in the landscape. All right, so here is our Juneberry, also called Shadbush or Serviceberry, genus Amelanchier. There's at least eight uh, members of this genus that are native to New England, and they hybridize. So they're really hard to tell apart, but you don't need to know how because they're all edible, at least in terms of eating them. And so the best time to spot a Juneberry in the wild is in the spring when it's blooming because it blooms before um, the crab apples do, so it stands out in the landscape. Remember where that spot is, and then in June, you look for something like this. You look for a bunch of fruits that look like blueberries, but they never turn blue. They turn kind of this purpley color. They got the crowns on them like blueberries do. And if you eat them, you find that they don't really taste like blueberries. They taste like a cross between cherries and almonds. And so they're really great for stuffing your face right by the tree. Now, this is a tree, th this fruit is popular with songbirds. And so you will have some competition from the birds in gathering this fruit. But in the places where I gather it, uh, there's plenty of fruit, there's plenty of plants, and uh, there's enough to go around so the birds can go to the top branches and eat those fruit, and I can pick from the bottom branches, and we can all share and pick out and have a great time. So I'm actually going to tell you a place to pick June berries, and that is along the Charles River in Boston and Cambridge as it's heading toward uh, the section on the other side of the uh, um, uh, the Route 93 and the... the uh, what's it called, the, the Zakin Bridge. There are parks there where the DCR and other park departments have planted dozens of the Juneberry plants. And so I used to work in downtown Boston. I walk over to these parks in my lunch hour and pick quarts of this fruit. And now I would eat most of it, but I also propagated plants from it. And so there's strudel that you can make from Juneberry. So here's what you do. You eat the fruit spit the seeds, which are otherwise perfectly edible, but if you want to grow the plants, you have to save the seeds, spit them into your hand, throw them in a plastic bag, throw it in your fridge, and then uh, you can uh, wait to the following spring to sow them or sow them once they uh, sprout, which can happen sometimes is the Juneberry seeds will be precocious and start sprouting in the little plastic bags, in the dark, in the fridge. When that happens, you have to sow them right away, which I've done here. And so I got plants that are now three feet tall in my nursery that I grew from going to a public park and gathering Juneberries and just saving the seeds and sowing them. So you can do it too. All right, wild strawberry. This is a great plant for diversifying your lawn with. If you're still, can't give up your lawn, but you wanna like, like, uh, take the first step of a 12-step landscape makeover program. And the first step is just, well, diversify your lawn. Okay, so wild strawberry is something you could put in there. And it has these white flowers that the pollinators like and this delectable, small but delectable red fruit, which is great. And you can make tea from wild strawberry leaves. You want to um, uh, pick them, use them fresh or thoroughly dried. Apparently when they're wilted, they're slightly toxic, but fresh or thoroughly dried is fine. And the tea does taste vaguely like the fruit and it has vitamin C in it. So if you felt a case of scurvy coming on, you could make yourself some strawberry tea. And uh, when I gather seed and I have extra to spare, I'll share it with different groups like this girls' school out in the Berkshires where I gave them some wild strawberry seed, which they sowed in these repurposed uh, berry containers, these clamshell containers, and they grew the plants out to be big enough to sell them where the broccoli starts and their other stuff to their customers, their spring plant sale. 
violet. So there's the common dooryard violet. There's another great plant to diversify your lawn with. I've got thousands of these in my lawn, so many that I can dig up a whole bunch and give to other people and still have plenty left behind. And uh, the flowers are very pretty uh, to just throw into salads or you can candy them and use to decorate other dishes. So yeah, so here's a, a close up of my lawn with all the violets in it. And I just dug some up and there they are potted up, ready to go to other places. Flowering raspberry, it's a gorgeous plant with these very showy magenta flowers, these enormous maple-like leaves and no thorns. So this would be worth planting in your yard even if you never ate it, just to look at it. So here's the main edible part on the plant, these berries, which they're a bit drier than regular raspberry, raspberries, but otherwise good. Black raspberry, definitely delectable fruit. But one fun landscape feature of black raspberries is what they do during the off season is their thorny canes turn this lovely purple color. And so everything behind can be brown and drab or snow covered and the purple canes really stand out. And it's a great way actually to find these plants in the wild. Look for the purple thorny canes, you know that's black raspberry, and then go back to that spot late June, early July to look for the fruit. Okay, so elderberries. Uh, have edible flowers and edible fruits. And if you pick the flowers, you don't get any fruit on the plant. So I tend to just leave the flowers on the plant. And uh, I'm going to go straight to this, which is the fruit. And the fruit isn't good to eat raw, but if you cook it first or you dry it first, you can uh, eat it as much as you want. And uh, I like to mix elderberries and apples together, make elderberry apple pie, elderberry apple sauce is better than just plain apple pie or applesauce. And you can grow elderberry from seed, which I've done in my nursery. And when the plants get big and then the roots start coming out the bottom of the pot, you could tease the plants apart into separate pots. So you could just take the entire content in the small pot and just uh, procrastinate by just moving it all into a bigger pot and then growing the plants bigger that way. Uh, and then you can prick them out and, and plant them out or move them into other containers. All right, so here's the Monarda I mentioned. This is Monarda fistulosa, the wild bergamot. Very important plant for at-risk bees and other pollinators. So important to add just for pure ecological reasons, but it's edible to people. And despite the name, I find the flavor doesn't taste like Earl Grey tea at all. It tastes like oregano. And so that's how I'd recommend that you use these leaves as a substitute for oregano. Here's another uh, uh, of our native wild mints. This is called mountain mint or clustered mountain mint. And this one has a very strong pepperminty flavor. So this one you could make a peppermint type tea out of. And lots of uh, insects visit these flowers. I'm not sure they're all pollinating. Some might just be eating the, the pollen, the nectar. But anyway, if you want to see uh, a real um, uh, gathering of insects on plants, uh, I see more in this one than I see in anything else I'm growing including these very cool, and I don't, you know, scary looking, but actually I don't think uh, harmful to people, these uh, great blue wasps. Okay, so we've got a bunch of plants that have historical significance like this one, the sweet goldenrod, which is one of the plants that colonists made tea from during the Revolutionary War when they were kind of the British tea. And it's a licorice flavored tea. It's really good. It's the leaves and the flowers. It's very easy to grow from seed. Here's sweet fern that I showed at the beginning of my show. So this is great if you've got a site that's really dry and poor soil. That's the natural habitat for this plant. So it doesn't mind at all hanging out near garages, parking lots, uh, really gravelly soil is all fine. And you make a tea from the leaves. Spice bush, you can make a tea from the twigs, which is what the colonists did. You can gather these berries and dry them and use them as a spice. So they're not edible straight into your mouth. You dry them and use them as a spice. And that's what they look like after you dry them. And, um, and they're a good substitute for Szechuan peppercorns or black pepper. They're that flavor. It's a very savory spice. Uh, oh, let me go back for just a second. I need to talk about something important. Okay. so. These red berries, though, they're very high in lipids, so they're high in calories, and the songbirds know that. And so the songbirds will seek out ripe spice bush berries to help fatten up for their southward winter, winter migration. So if you're ever picking spice bush berries in the wild, make sure to leave lots of berries on the plants so the birds get all they need that way. Okay, and you can grow spice bush plants from seed, which I've done. So you allow the outer pulp on their fruit to rot off a little bit, pull it off, and then these seeds 
are hydrophilic, which means you can't let them dry out because if you do, they lose their viability. So you have to store them in a little plastic bag in your fridge and then sow them and grow plants that way. And when you plant spice bush, and this is a practice I pretty much do for everything I sow in my nursery, I deploy this half inch mesh hardware cloth over all my flats. If you do not do this, you run the risk of the ravenous rodents coming and just digging up all your plants, trying to get whatever's left of that sprouting seed in the soil. And they'll just unearth all your seedlings at the process. Rather than coming out to your nursery and just looking with dismay in that scene, if you take this preventative measure beforehand, you should avoid that problem. All right, another reason why you might want to plant these spice bushes, it's the host plant for this really cool critter called the spice bush swallowtail butterfly caterpillar. So when the egg first hatches, this instar, this young caterpillar is only about a half an inch long. It's impersonating bird poop, which is a really ingenious and clever disguise. Then when the caterpillar gets bigger, it develops these fake eyes. The real eyes are down here. These are fake eye spots. So the caterpillar is trying to impersonate a snake and scare the birds away from that. And then even at the pupa stage, this caterpillar has this ingenious disguise where it looks just like a dried leaf. So isn't this an amazing organism that has evolved all these uh, ways to hide from being eaten? All right, so wintergreen is edible. This is good if you've got a pine tree. Uh, this grows really well underneath pine trees where the needles are. And it has that wintergreen flavor, that tea berry gum type flavor. And you can make a tea from it, but when I make a wintergreen flavored tea, I usually do it from black or yellow birch twigs and uh, you get the same flavor and it's much easier and faster to make it this way. It takes only about an hour. And uh, this is how you do it. You just take, and this is year round. You just take a bunch of the black or yellow birch twigs, peel them, put the peeled twigs and peelings in a jar, fill it up with water, just let it sit around for an hour. And then you have this delicious wintergreen flavored tea. And you can, plant birch, you can grow uh, black or yellow birch from the seeds, which you can collect in the middle of the winter. They sh they're shed by this thing called the strobel, and uh, they'll just end up on the surface of a snow at, right after a snowstorm. Just pick the seeds off the surface of the snow and then put the seeds right on the surface of the ground or the growing medium because these seeds actually need light to germinate. And then you get your birch trees that way. And I have dozens of birch trees in my nursery. I grew exactly this way. And there they are. Okay, were this a live program, I'd be asking everybody in the audience, what is this plant? And maybe somebody knows. And then often, though, I would say most of the time I get complete silence. And then I give them a big hint. I say, okay, here's a boardwalk going over a dune. Does that help you? And then usually, not always, somebody says, oh, is that beach plum? And that is the answer. This is beach plum. This might be the most valuable piece of information I'm going to offer you today for any of you that have wondered I've heard about this thing called the beach plum, but I've never found it. Where are they? And the answer is you're probably looking at the wrong time of year. You want to look for beach plums in May in the spring when they're blooming because then they're covered with these creamy white, very densely packed blossoms that makes them easy to spot the bushes at a distance. So find them then, remember where they are, and then go back around Labor Day weekend to pick the fruit. That's what the fruit looks like when it's ripe. It's this purpley color, which is hard to see at a distance. You almost have to be standing right by the beach plum to find it. And beach plums don't have to grow near the ocean. I took this photo in Worcester County a number of years ago when I found some beach plums growing very far from the ocean. So as long as you have a sunny site, reasonably well-drained soil. You can absolutely grow beech plums. Let me just say, though, you have to plant at least two genetically distinct plants, though, because uh, they're not self-fertile. And yes, you can make delicious things from beech plum, the jam, of course, and then bake dishes like these rugalak you can make from the uh, uh, beech plum jam, which is great. Okay, and beech plums come in a yellowish orange variety occasionally, and these taste at least as good as the purple ones. And beech plums uh, are also precocious. I save the pits for every wild beech plum I pick. I try to grow a tree from it. I've grown hundreds in my nursery. And yeah, they'll, they'll be precocious and sprout early. Okay, may apple is great if you've got a shady yard that's reasonably damp. And the leaves are very nice to look at. There are the flowers hiding underneath the leaves. That's why it's called may apple because it blooms in May. And here's the edible part, the fully ripe fruit. I emphasize fully. If it's not fully ripe, it's not going to taste good and it's slightly poisonous. So wait till it's fully ripe. It'll be this deep yellow color and actually will usually be very soft and begin to wrinkle like that. And then the inside is really tropical like a guava, really delicious. 
okay, there are no poisonous species of viburnum, I'm happy to tell you. So uh, they don't all taste good, like maple leaf viburnum fruit don't taste good. Uh, viburnum dentatum, the arrowwood fruit, don't taste good, but several do. So here is the nanny berry, viburnum lentego fruit. They taste good. Uh, the wild raisin, raisin fruit tastes good. So uh, those viburnums are worth growing. Okay, so here's sumac, and I hope all of you know this already, but I do have lots of people in audiences that I talk to that think that any sumac must be the poison sumac because that's the only sumac they've heard of. Well, that is not true. In fact, any sumac with these tight upright clusters of red fruit is not only not poison sumac, it's edible sumac. Let me just quickly show you what poison sumac fruit looks like. That's what it looks like, really, really similar to poison ivy fruit, to which it is a very close cousin. And so there's no resemblance at all to that. All right, so back to the edible sumac. So this is stagger and sumac in the photo. Wing sumac and uh, smooth sumac can also be used the same way. So the main thing you do is you make a drink from the berries and the berries are ripe in the summer. So you just gather them and you put them in a bowl of water and you rub them. You're rubbing the flavoring off the berries into the liquid and the liquid will turn this pinkish orange color. Fish the berries out, you're done with them. Take the liquid that you have left, put it through any kind of a strainer like a paper towel. And then what goes through, you can drink hot or cold, sweetened or unsweetened. There it is. And all this text is telling you, I strongly discourage you from putting any sumac seed that you've made a drink with into your compost, unless you wanna be picking out sumac plants for years later. So in my case, I, I make uh, sumac plants out of the sumac lemonade by uh, potting up these little baby plants in my raised beds and you know putting them out of my nursery, but you might be tired of that. And sumac is another amazing fall foliage plant. So grapes, you might say, ah, I don't want to plant grapes because they'll clamber over everything else in my yard. I, I don't want that. But if you have the space for them, our native species of grapes are really great. So here is the fox grape. And this is the conquer grape, what we call conquer grape. This is its uh, native, one of its native ancestors. It has the same flavor. It's delicious. Um, I harvest these every year. And, you know, so it's pretty typical to have baskets like this in my car in the fall. And I love to make sorbet with them, which is very easy. One year, my wife made this grape cheesecake, which was delicious uh, from the fox grape. Now, uh, we have another species of grape called the riverside grape, where the grapes are smaller and not as yummy. But this is a species with a smooth underside to the leaf that some people say makes the better stuffed grape leaf. And so that you harvest these in the spring, like in May and June, harvest these fully unrolled, but still young leaves, and then make grape leaves from them. They come out really good. Okay, so a uh, bunch of edible nuts out there. Here's the common hazelnut, uh, which is already finished blooming. It's a really early bloomer. And here's what the nuts look like. And don't wait till these hit the ground because you'll never find them. You have to pick them off the plants when they're still attached. And uh, here's the... Um, uh, beak taste and that with the nuts developing in here and you have this strange bird beak sticking out. And all this text is just basically telling you that hazelnuts and other nuts are all hydrophilic. They all need to stay moist inside the shell. If you let them dry out, they lose their viability. And if you're trying to find hazelnuts in the wild, I look for them under power lines. And I don't think it's the electrical magnetic radiation. I think it's just all the sun the plants get there. And that it's kind of a scary place for a squirrel and chipmunk to work those plants, to take all the nuts, because there's a lot of predators out there. OK, so all oak trees produce acorns, and all acorns are edible. It's just they vary as, as to how much tannic acid they have. I find that the white oak acorns have a lower level of tannic acid. So that's the one I've used to leach the tannic acid out, which you still need to do anyway, and then um, uh, make a meal out of them, which you use for baked goods that uh, can be really yummy. Oh, and if you try to grow a white oak from an acorn, you need to sow it right away, because this is what happens this just a few weeks after the acorns fall off the trees, as they begin to sprout right away. So this doesn't happen with red or black acorns. It happens just with the white oak acorns. So if you want to grow white oaks from acorns, sow them in the fall. You'll do much better because this is what can happen. If you attempt to store, store them, the, the radicals will come out and then they just rot. Okay, so here's my number one favorite edible plant out of all of them that's there, the shagbark hickory. That's what the bark looks like. That's not a seasonal phenomenon. So um, 
I will tell you a spot in Newton where I know there's at least one shagbark hickory that's growing. And that is in the park that is next to the old Norbega Park grounds. So this is before you get to the Marriott on Route 30, heading west on the right side of the road. There's a park where there's a, a ball field and I think they play softball there. Well, there's a bunch of trees in that park too. And there's a shagbark hickory tree in that park. So, uh, so I gave you a place to go to look for this. Okay, so here are the nuts in September and October. I look for these. And here's one of the Native American dishes this is where the name comes from, Pauka Hickra. That's where we get the name Hickory. And, um, and so I'm gathering many, many hundreds of these nuts every fall. It's my number one favorite species. And most of these I'm eating, but some of these I'm propagating into trees. So here's the maple hickory nut pie recipe from my book. It's the New England equivalent of a pecan pie. And it's really good. And, um, and virtually everybody I feed this to say, this is even better than pecan pie. And I attribute that to the amazing flavor of the hickory nuts. And were this to be a live program, I might have made these cookies on the right for you to serve them to you. These are my uh, triple maple hickory nut sandwich cookies where the cookie part is sweetened with maple sugar and maple syrup. And then the filling in the middle is maple cream. They're really, really good. <laughs> Sorry, can't feed them to you online. And yes, if you want to grow shagbark hickories from the nuts, which I've done and continue to do, you need to keep them moist, don't let them dry out, and then sow them in deep pots so the roots, which get very long, can grow. And then you have to deploy this hardware cloth to prevent the ravenous rodents from unearthing your nuts and, and, um, and destroying your trees. Black walnuts are edible and you don't have to pick them off the tree, wait till they hit the ground and then they look like that. And then uh, you can grow black walnuts from the nuts or you can just harvest them. You have to get that outer part off, which I, admittedly is a messy task. And then this is what you have. And then these shells are really hard. So I have a nutcracker like this to get them open and it works really well. Then you get big pieces out like that. And black walnuts and uh, honey pair really well. So that's the recipe I use them in. So had this been a live program, this is one of the things I might have baked and brought and served to you. This is the black walnut honey squares that really easy to make and very good. Pawpaws. Now, pawpaws don't occur anywhere in Massachusetts as a native plant, as far as we know. There is a feral patch of pawpaws. There's actually two of them in Lexington that really look like the native pawpaw patches I've seen in the Mississippi Valley, like along the Ohio River. It's amazing how similar they are and they fruit and produce fruit. So you could actually grow pawpaws in your own yard if you wanted to, the conditions are temperate enough for them. Uh, they actually don't mind and, and prefer quite a bit of shade. So if you have a shady yard, not a problem at all. And do grow two genetically distinct individuals though, because you'll need that in order to get fruit. And there's the fruit. I am unfortunately allergic to pawpaws and I get a bad rash on my face when I try to eat them. So I cannot enjoy them. But for people that aren't, they're really good. That, that uh, custardy fruit is really yummy. Okay, so I don't have time to talk about all these other species, but these are a bunch of other edible tree species. Sorry, we don't have time to get into those. Uh, groundnut has an edible tuber. That's what it looks like. And so far, my favorite way to use it is just to fry them in a little vegetable oil, just slice them up, fry them in vegetable oil, and make groundnut chips. They're very good that way. Jerusalem artichoke is a native plant to the Midwest, but it was here growing all over New England in the early 1600s when the first uh, explorers and colonists came to New England. How did it get here? It's because the Massachusetts tribe and other tribes traded for it. As we had quahog shells and other things that applied, that appealed to the Midwestern tribes and we got drew some artichoke tubers in return. And what I say in my book, there's a chapter in this plant in my book is that it's very likely that patches where this plant is growing in the wild now are patches that descended from patches that were originally established by Native Americans many years ago. And this is what the tubers look like. And you can use them like potatoes. Most ways you can bake them, boil them, mash them, fry them, and so on. All right. So with the few minutes I have left, I'm going to go through what I do with all these seeds that I've been growing. So I, uh, I have this nursery out in Weston, uh, actually very close to where I grew up. And then I uh, partner with different groups to plant out plants in appropriate places on their properties. So here's a list and I will uh, give this list, an electronic version of this list to Beth so she can share it with all of you uh, when she sends her follow-up email tomorrow, uh, including a couple of the recipes I covered before. I'll include those too in, in what I give Beth. And this just tells you all the native species that are edible. So this is the list I work from. So here's a shot of my nursery and here's another shot of my nursery. 
And, uh, and part of it is behind my mom's house in Weston. And there's my mom helping me with wild lettuce. So wild lettuce might not be the, the plant that you might choose to grow in your own yard because it's not as docile as regular lettuce like this. It's a biennial. In the second year, it does this. And you can eat it in the first year or the second year. Uh, but it is easy to grow from seed. And this is the lettuce that has the um, uh, broad leaves. This isn't as tasty as the one that has the narrow leaves that I showed first. And there's the lettuce seed that you can gather and grow your own wild lettuce. Okay, so here is the, uh, my stratification fridge it was a little bit more well organized, but this is where you stow seeds that needs to be kept cold for a certain number of days in order to get it to come out of dormancy. This list you don't have to read, it's just an example of some of the places where I've done planting. Here's a quick example from Marblehead where there's an island owned by the trustees of reservations where they gave you permission to plant beach plums. So I found the habitat, dug the holes, organized a bunch of volunteers, and then we headed across the mudflat at low tide with the plants, put them in, and there they are. And yes, the um, so this is one of my early projects. So I made some rookie mistakes. So I've only got six of the plants of the 14 I originally planted still growing, but those are fruiting and doing quite well. Here's another island. This is Baker's Island in Salem, uh, where I've done a bunch of planting and those plants are doing really well. Here's a paddler access point along the Connecticut River. This one is in the town of Waitley. And this one's in the town of Montague, where I partnered with the State Parks Agency, the DCR, and the Appalachian Mountain Club to put in edible native plants to supplement what was already growing at these paddler access campsites. Here's a site called Riverwalk in Great Barrington, Massachusetts, right near downtown Great Barrington. It's this wonderful refuge, beautiful area, very uh, nice to walk, very scenic right along the uh, Housatonic River. And I've done a bunch of planting there. Here's a site down in Buzzards Bay where I put in marsh marigolds on a site owned by the Coalition for Buzzards Bay or Buzzards Bay Coalition. Here's a site in Lexington where they daylighted a stream and they needed some plants to put in the area that it was disturbed by the construction. So here we are, uh, plants from my nursery, plants that the town was able to purchase from the consultant supplier. We put them in. And this is what I love to see. When I look in a landscape and see a spot in the landscape and say, gee, I think this spot would be good for blankety blank species. And in this case, I planted the flowering raspberry next to the stream and it is thriving there. And I feel like if I could read a plant's mind, this plant is sending me a message. Thank you, Russ, for planting me here. I'm so happy here. Here's another side we planted down the South Shore, an organic farm called Holly Hill Farm, where I lead wild plant walks. And now there's additional edible native species growing at the farm that I can talk about in addition to the species that were already there. Here's a book I recommend if you want to really know about edible native plants and know what uh, critters benefit from adding that plant to your landscape. This book is really great for that. It's actually published in Cincinnati and it's aimed at an audience of Midwesterners, but I see a lot of applicability to uh, yards here in New England too. So I heartily recommend the book. And with that, I'm done. And so let me just tell you what's on this slide and then I'm happy to take questions. So. So I have this book, yeah, that Beth mentioned. And um, now the book, truth be told, covers everything that's edible in a plant out there. So it isn't confined to just the native species. Sure, there's native species like the beech plum I talked about before, and the black raspberry I talked about before, and the elderberry that I talked about before. But there's autumn olive invasive species. There's Japanese knotweed that makes a delicious pie that's invasive species. There's black locusts that's invasive species. So, but uh, the point of including them in the book is to say that, you know, if you're gathering from the wild, invasives offer and the abundant weeds like dandelion offer guilt-free foraging opportunity because you don't have to worry about, oh, gee, am I hurting the bugs and the bunnies by picking too much of this plant? No, <laughs> the plants are ubiquitous. They're, you know, it, uh, if anything, the environment might benefit a little bit by you gathering them. So yes, yeah, so edible invasives. My attitude about them is if they're, if they're, if the ecologists eradicate them, fine. But in the meantime, if they're in our landscape and they're edible, I'm going to eat them and teach other people how to eat them too. So they're in the book, including a lot of native species. And uh, you can get the book online from Greenbelt. There's the link right there. And uh, I'll make sure to give this information to Beth so she has to share with people. And with that, I'm done and I'm ready to take questions. 
Okay, this was just absolutely awesome. And there's so much for us to try. It also brings back memories for me of being on your walks, which I highly recommend if you're doing one for our audience to go on. You just eat your way through wherever you're going. My last one with you was on Wellesley campus. We did one on the North Shore. Your autumn olive fruit leather is absolutely yummy. Uh, so people look, look for his walks to go on them. And now let's go to the questions we have piling up. We have a question here. Do bears like Juneberries? Yes, sure. Uh, anything that's sweet and yummy. Uh, so, so bears have an omnivorous diet. So they're pretty close to humans in terms of what they eat. Of course, they eat a lot of, you know, insects, which uh, we've been kind of culturally uh, designed to go yuck. Uh, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, bears will, will eat uh, the shadbush berries, certainly. Robins love them. Oh, my shadbush tree. Oh, my goodness. It's covered with robins. I have to fight to get a couple off. We have another question about wildlife. Uh, don't the rabbits eat your seedlings that grow through the wire grid? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, I have had some problem with rabbits, but not necessarily what you think. So uh, let me share two problems I've personally had. First one is, I said that wild strawberries were a great plant to add to a lawn. So I added them to my lawn and then they slowly disappeared. And the only explanation I have for that is our ubiquitous rabbits ate them to extinction. And why would they do that? I think that the rabbits knew that there was some benefit to their diversifying their diet beyond just the clover and the grass and the other stuff in our yard and the violets by supplementing what they were eating with the wild strawberry leaves. And so they hammered them. So, um, so I may have to really, uh, you know, put in a huge number of strawberry plants so that the rabbits take what they want and I have some that survive and continue to thrive. That would be my strategy for trying that again. The other problem I have with rabbits is not eating the green leaves, it's eating the twigs in the fall because I understand that what rabbits do is that their digestive system actually, you know how rabbits, sometimes their coats change color for the winter, they have a winter coat and a, and a summer coat. Well, their yeah. digestive systems apparently work the same way is as the fall comes on, the rabbits switch to a diet of twigs because pretty soon there aren't going to be green leaves to eat. And so their digestive system changes seasonally to eat twigs. And so I will see a lot of rabbit browse on the woody twigs in my nursery and other places where I've done planting. And rabbit browse is pretty easy to recognize because it has a very distinctive slanty cut, really clean cut as if somebody took little pruning shears and went like that. You know, so it isn't like a deer, which a deer only has one set of teeth, so it can't make a clean cut like that. A deer makes a jagged cut, but a rabbit makes a really clean cut. So if you're seeing a clean, slanty cut on your twigs, that's rabbit browse. And how does it help you to know that <laughs> to you, Dave? <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> so, so the good news is that many of our woody species have evolved ways to cope with rabbit browse. So for example, beach plum. Uh, so I've had beach plum seedlings in my nursery get uh, uh, nibbled down to the nub by rabbits. But if there's any above ground stuff stem left, the plant will uh, form new buds and grow out new twigs from what's left, uh, usually. Uh, uh, beach plums have that capacity. And so, um, now, if the rabbits keep hammering it over and over and over again, eventually the plant might die. But uh, but native woody species do have some capacity of uh, withstanding the browse to some extent. That's interesting. I they're not edible, but I put in some new willows uh, last year that were absolutely hammered by the rabbits. Yeah. And I found that when my hemlock lost branches, if I sort of piled them around it, they would eat the hemlock. And oh. eating my willow. So I, that's my new strategy. Don't yeah. help it will work for more than once. But uh, 
uh, terrific. Uh, we have another question about the mesh that you put over. Uh, how do you get the seedlings out of the grates to plant? Oh, oh, yeah, that's a good question. So in some cases, uh, and if I were really organized in a very meticulous record keeper, which I am not, I could tell you off the top of my head which species this works for and which doesn't. But I assure you that for some species, as long as you're gentle, you can just lift that mesh slowly, even when the twigs are like, you know, a foot tall or taller, and the leaves just go through the little half inch holes in the mess and they're fine and you don't have to do anything. And that will work for some species. Now for other species where that doesn't work, what I will do is get some tin snips and just cut a little bit around uh, where the individual stem is just to leave enough space for the plant to go through as I pull it up. And so that makes that mesh uh, unsuitable for using in a place where the animals could get in through the holes you've created. So sometimes I'll have a way to repurpose it where that's not a problem, but that, that is the one downside of having to cut the mesh in that case. Okay, thank you. Uh, Alice wants to know, nurseries almost never sell plants by gender. For Lindera and others that need both male and female to reproduce to produce fruit, how can you know whether you're getting both genders? And she says, is there a minimum number of plants you'd suggest buying to hedge your bets? <laughs> well, two would be the minimum. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, the, the, the more, you know, the better off you are if you have the space. Uh, yeah, it is a problem. And that is true. Uh, um, most nurseries don't allow plants to get big enough so that their gender is revealed and you know what they are and you can sell them knowing what they are. Uh, one exception is I have found that Garden in the Woods, uh, the Native Plant Trust, uh, both at their Framingham facility and the Nisami Farm, their nursery out in Western Mass, they do make a good faith effort to sex out the plants that they sell because they do, in some cases, allow them to get big enough to make that possible. So uh, if you're having trouble with other nurseries, that's where I would point you. Terrific. Thank you. Barbara wants to know, could you grow beech plums in a backyard? Do oh, absolutely. Need, okay. Do you need to freeze seed or do any special prep? Oh, so, um, so if you... Um, Let's say you uh, went to a place last September, found some beach plums, gathered some fruit, saved the pits. So uh, I uh, stratify my pits. So they go into a plastic bag with some vermiculite and it's slightly damp and that's how I store them. I'm not sure that is actually necessary. That's what I do. It's possible you might be able to store the pits dry and the moisture will stay inside the little uh, pit. Uh, and and the and can grow just from sowing a, a dried fruit. Uh, I don't know, but you do have to chill it. They do need to be stratified, whether it's um, kept moist like I do or whether it's kept dry. So you have to do that. So um, so let's say you haven't done that. You've just got some some beach plum pits just sitting on your desk. What can you do? You could sow them now, and what would happen is you probably wouldn't see the pit sprout until next spring. Is the, the fruit would just stay in the ground. I mean, the pits would stay in the ground and not do anything until they've had that uh, chilling, which they need as the prerequisite to breaking dormancy. Okay. Patty wants to know, I've always heard that if it's bitter, it might be poisonous. So if it tastes okay, is it generally safe to eat? Oh, uh, I try to avoid sweeping generalizations like that. Uh, but I will say uh, I'll offer one, okay? In the case of berries, I do not personally know of any berry that grows wild around here. And I'm not talking about like going to the Arnold Arboretum where plants come in from all over the world. I'm talking about your typical wild landscape. And I don't know of any berry that grows in our region that's delicious and poisonous. So if you nibble on a berry and it tastes good, I think you're okay. Um, but if it doesn't taste good, uh, spit it out. Now, now I will add one caveat, okay? 
if you nibble on a poison sumac or poison ivy berry, that is hazardous in and of itself, even if you don't swallow it, because just nibbling on it is give you, give you enough exposure to that uh, irritating oil that that you could really be harmed by doing that. So never put a poison ivy or sumac berry in your mouth. But for other berries, uh, even if it tastes bad and you spit it out, the uh, you know, so so basically if something is poisonous, you really have to ingest it to get poison from it. Just putting it in your mouth briefly isn't going to cause you to, you know, need to go to the emergency room or anything. So if you spit it right out, the worst thing is likely to happen is that you feel nauseous for a while, and that's probably because you scared yourself to death more than anything. <laughs> so once again, though, I don't make this a practice. I didn't learn this stuff by walking down the trail, popping stuff in my mouth and see what happened because all the trial and error work has been done by Native Americans and other people over thousands of years. So we can benefit from that accumulated knowledge. But you do, you can consider your taste buds as a backup identification tool. If you're pretty sure you've got the right thing and a quick taste will confirm that you've got the right thing or not. Okay, now in the on the subject in peculiarity of bitter, uh, let's talk about leaves because we have some bitter leaves that can be definitely bitter and yet be very uh, tasty if you have a certain amount of tolerance for bitter. If you don't like any bitter whatsoever, then these leaves are never going to work for you. But like dandelion and chicory, there's the leaves that are very healthy for you to eat. And in fact, uh, you know, some of the recent conversations I've seen about the bitter principle in plants is that, yes, a lot of poisonous things are bitter, but also a lot of uh, plants that are very good for you have some bitterness to them. It's a natural defense mechanism that plants develop to make sure they're not eaten completely extinct. So, but um, but certainly a certain amount of bitter, you know, maybe not a whole bowl of just dandelion leaves, but mixed in with other things or chicory the same way uh, can be very tolerable. And, and, um, and as I was uh, beginning to say, there's some uh, feeling, which I think has some justification that, uh, that it's good for people to eat some bitter things, that it activates some, you know, the liver and some other uh, organs in our body that need the stimulation of some bitterness in our diet in order to work properly. So that, that seems to make sense to me. What about those of us who live with ravenous four-legged beasts? Is it pretty much that what's safe for humans is safe for dogs? No, no, not at all. Because there isn't a 100% overlap between what people can eat and what animals can eat because our taste buds and our digestive systems are different. So let's go back to poison ivy. Those berries that would be very harmful for people to eat, Lots of bird species eat those berries and deer will browse on poison ivy leaves. And obviously we're not gonna fight them over the poison ivy. They can have all the poison ivy they want. In fact, we probably all wish they'd eat more poison ivy. All right, so there's stuff out there that, that animals can safely eat that we can't eat at all and vice versa. You know, I'm, I'm not as well versed in this as I should be, but you know, let's take a, a well-known example, chocolate. You know, chocolate is, is apparently harmful for dogs to eat, okay? And we love it. <laughs> so yeah, so, so just noticing what an animal eats doesn't in any way uh, uh, help inform you as to whether or not it's safe for you to eat. I also worry the opposite. If we're planting these things in our yard, my dogs eat everything. So there's some wonderful lists online. And yeah. whenever I'm putting something in that's yeah. going to be in their turf, I go look it up. Yeah, yeah, that's smart. So, um, you know, I, occasionally I will get, you know, these uh, panicky emails from people saying, oh, I was just in my backyard and this dog ate a mushroom. And what do I do? And, uh, and I, I honestly don't know. Um, certainly lots of animals can eat mushrooms. I just don't know about dogs. And, you know, so uh, I, I, I profess my ignorance in this subject. Terrific. We have just a couple more minutes here. Uh, let me see. What can, what can we do here? Uh, where can you forage around the Charles River, Boston? We have a question. Okay. Yeah. Good question. So, so the rules are kind of murky and ambiguous about foraging. Uh, you know, the, the safe thing to do, of course, if it's at all possible, is to find the owner or manager of the property where you want to forage and just ask them. Uh, and one really good thing, if you're able to do that, and 
I almost always get a yes when I ask, and actually people like it when you ask, is then you can forge in a really joyful, carefree way. And you don't have to be peeking over your shoulder every once in a while saying, is somebody going to get on my case for doing this? So that's a really nice aspect. I realize it isn't possible all the time. Like if you're paddling on the Charles River and you see some nice black raspberries or grapes growing by the river, it's really, you're going to get out of your boat and walk a quarter mile to find out who owns the property's <laughs> house's way in the street. No, you're not going to do that. You're just going to eat that fruit. And I think that's okay. So you can't always find out. Um, uh, so uh, uh, I don't... I don't have any uh, magic rules for those people that are, you know, in and around Newton other than that. Uh, but if you were to go further afield, you know, elsewhere in Eastern Mass, I could speak more at length about places that it's okay to forage. But in terms of uh, Charles River Newton, stuff like that, find the owner or manager and ask. That's the, the surefire way to know that it's okay. Thank you for that good advice and so much other advice. If you have questions, we'll send this email address out too. You can submit them to Russ at eatwild at rcn.com. Or you can always, uh, we have a question about mushrooms here that we can't answer right now. You can send them questions to webinars at newtonconservators.org. And thank you. We're getting lots of thank yous to you, Russ, in the, in the chat. Thank you very much. Thank you, My everyone. My pleasure. Hope to Bye, see everybody. you next week. Bye-bye.